Welcome to episode 109 of Real Health Radio. You can find the links talked about as part of this episode at the show notes, which is www.7, so the word all spelt out, S-E-V-E-N, hyphenhealth.com forward slash 109. Welcome to Real Health Radio. Health advice that's more than just about how you look. And here's your host, Chris Sandel. Welcome to Real Health Radio. So another year is coming to a close and I I really can't quite get my head around it or believe it. And I sit recording this a couple of days after Christmas and my folks have come over from Australia and I now have a new son, Ramsey, who is actually three months old on Christmas Day. And we had a really lovely Christmas, like loads of wine and champagne and ham and turkey and chocolates and Every time I now open the fridge, I have literally kilos of meat uh, just staring back at me, uh, waiting to be eaten, uh, but I'm doing my best to get through it. So I'm going to keep up an annual tradition, and this will be the third time that I've done this kind of a show. And it's where I go through my favorite books and documentaries that I've consumed over the last 12 months. And in the show notes, I list everything that I've read and watched But as part of this episode, I'm just going to highlight, say, six or seven things from each of these lists. And I've actually read a little less this year than previously. It's amazing how much time house hunting and pregnancy appointments and then having an actual baby can take up. So in the end, I think uh, I read 17 books. And when I say I read, like some of those were audio books, but hopefully you know what I mean. And there could have been some extras in there, but Due to moving house, all my books got packed up and moved. And previously, all my books, once I'd finished, they just went on a certain spot in the bookshelf, at least most of the time. So it made it quite easy to then complete this list or compile this list. But with moving house, I got a completely new bookshelf and actually decided to color code all my books to create this artistic effect. And actually, the picture used for the podcast image uh, on my website for this episode is a picture of the bookshelf. And I'm really pleased with how it looks, Um, but what this has meant is that everything got moved around. So hopefully I've included all of them, but I might have missed one or two. Um, On the the documentary front, uh, I watched 37 documentaries in total, and I think the first year I did this, I'd watched 57 documentaries, so it is significantly less. And this was because I really just had less time on my own. So Ali is my ha- my other half, and she's into horse riding, which takes up an inordinate amount of time. So previously on weekends, she'd go out early in the day, and then she'd come back in the evening time, and so I'd have all this time on my own, and I'd go play a round of golf, I'd take the dog for a mammoth walk, and then I'd still be able to come back and watch like one or two documentaries before she even got home. But with Ali being pregnant this year, not only was she not horse riding, we were just much busier going to appointments, looking at houses, and generally spending more time together. So I watched a lot less documentaries. I think nearly every one of the list from the documentaries is on Amazon Prime or Netflix. There's probably a couple that I just watched on on a website and paid for them. But I've linked every one of the documentaries to their IMDb page. So you can go have a look, you can go watch the trailer for them. And there's some really great stuff in there. I had just picked seven to talk about, um, but there are some others that were really great. And if I remember it, I will try and mention the names of them at the end rather than just giving the, the blurb of them. And finally, what I'm going to do this year is talk about some of my favorite podcasts. And I probably listen to around an hour and a half to two hours of podcasts a day. I'm in the kitchen cooking a lot or I'm out walking the dog and I'll often listen to this while I'm doing these things. And so I get through a lot of hours of of podcasts. So what I'm going to do is go through some of my favorite podcasts and mention an episode that I think you should start with. And with each of these that I mentioned, they are shows that I regularly listen to and like. So it's not just some one-off episode um, that I think was great, but rather shows that I suggest that you uh, might want to be subscribing to. And as we go through all this stuff, 
what you'll probably notice is how little a lot of this relates to health and nutrition in like a direct way. And I read and watch and listen to a real diverse mix of stuff. And this is interesting, obviously, to me. But I do find that it helps me as a practitioner, like being able to bring disparate ideas together or using some example from something totally unrelated to then help explain some other kind of phenomenon. I really feel like this is a strength. Um, it's often what I try and do with my blog posts. And again, I feel like it's in a strength. So the final thing I want to mention before I go on to the meat of this episode is that when I look at the statistics for each of these end of year review favorite book episodes, uh, they're often a lot lower than other episodes. But despite that, they are often the shows that I get the most emails about. So people telling me about books that they've loved or documentaries that they've watched or contacting me after consuming one of the recommendations I made and telling me how much they loved it. So please reach out and let me know your favorites for the year. I'm always on the lookout for new stuff to watch or read or listen to. And so I would love to hear from you. So you can either go to the show notes at www.7-health.com forward slash 109 and leave a comment, or you can email me at info at 7-health.com. So with all of that preamble out of the way, let's get started with this. And we'll begin with the books. So there's actually six that I want to mention. So the first book and my favorite book for the year is called Behave by Robert Sapolsky. And the subheading after Behave is The Biology of Humans at Our Best and Worst. So I've mentioned Sapolsky on the podcast before. He's hands down my favorite science writer. He's also an incredible speaker. And to label him a genius isn't really overstating it, considering he is the recipient of the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. Uh, his earlier book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, which is all about stress, has really had a huge impact on me and how I think about the role of stress in health and when working with clients. So Behave looks at why humans do what we do. And its ingenious method for doing this is to move back in time from the moment a behavior happens and then just going further and further back. So one second before a behavior happens, it looks at the brain and all of the different regions in the brain. And then second, seconds to minutes before the event, this is looking at the nervous system and neurotransmitters. And then hours to days before events, this is in the realm of hormones. And then days to months before the event, this is looking at brain again and things like neuroplasticity and things like memory. And then it goes back through all the developmental stages that take place in adolescence and then as babies. And then looking at how much of this is hardwired versus how much it's impacted on by, say, parenting styles, which is also impacted on by things like social status or socioeconomics. And then it looks at what happens during gestation. So the health of the mother during pregnancy and then the health of parents at conception. And as part of this, it covers things like genetics. And then it looks at centuries and millennia before the event. And this is looking at ancestry and how this affects how people uh, think. So if your ancestry is from a collectivist culture versus an individualist culture, it will impact the way that you think. And then it just goes further back looking at evolution and what our primates can tell us about us and, and, and so on. And all of this looking at it through the lens of what makes us loving, altruistic, civilized humans versus what makes us engage in violence and tribalism and the worst of human behavior. And for me, it is completely fascinating. And I will say, this isn't the easiest read. So Sapolsky does have a, a real knack for writing. He's incredibly funny and witty, but he's dealing with dense topics here. Um, he does try and make it as doable for someone without a background in all of this stuff. So when he talks about uh, uh, neurobiology or endocrinology or genetics, he includes appendices at the end of the book that gives primers in all of these areas, and they are incredibly helpful. Um, it's also not a book you are going to knock over quickly. So it comes in at over 700 pages, and it is a real doorstop of the book. But for anyone who is a science geek and wants to really understand why humans act the way that they do, uh, this is well worth spending the time reading. 
And Sapolsky has also done a couple of TED Talks, one of which is uh, about this book, and it's about 10 or 12 minutes long, and another one called The Uniqueness of Humans, which is possibly one of my favorite TED Talks of all time. So what I recommend is go check out these. If you like his style of talk, you'll also like the, the book, albeit in a much more dense form. So the second book I want to mention is The Intuitive Eating Workbook by Evelyn Tribole and Elise Resch. So in 2015, I included Intuitive Eating in my list of favorite books for the year. And this year, they released the workbook format. So what the workbook does is walk you through the 10 principles of intuitive eating. So those 10 principles are reject uh, reject the diet mentality, honor your hunger, make peace with food, challenge the food police, respect your fullness, discover the satisfaction factor, honor your feelings without using food, respect your body, exercise, and honor your health. And for each of these principles, it then looks at what it means as part of these principles and then goes through lots of writing exercises to help people see how they currently eat or currently think about food or their body and how this is either helpful or problematic and how they can change this. And I found this incredibly useful with clients. So for a long time, I've had clients do different writing exercises. And most of the time, we'll have a consult. And then after the consult, I'll give them a couple of writing exercises. And then we'll chat about it next time in the consult. And so having this book and having all of these different exercises has been really helpful. And the way that the book's structured is that you don't have to go through every single part of it. So there might be specific areas that are important to you. There might be specific areas that you're doing well on already, so it doesn't really matter. And so you can just pick and choose the chapters or the areas that are helpful, or you can go through the whole thing. And I've started using it with many of my clients, and I can't think of anyone who hasn't found the book really helpful. And So I really do love this book, and I I think over the years ahead, I'm going to be using it more and more. Um, So if you're new to the idea of intuitive eating, I think it's a really easy way to get into it um, and would highly recommend checking it out. So the next book I enjoyed and want to recommend is Sam Harris's book, Free Will. And as you will hear when I talk about my favorite podcast, I've become somewhat enamored with Harris in the last year, 18 months. And so not only did I read his book, Free Will, but I also read two others, uh, Lying, which is also excellent, and Waking Up, which again, is also great. Um, So Free Will, I actually listened to on Audible. Uh, In comparison to Behave, its length makes it incredibly easy to knock over. I can't think it's much more than an hour long, so it is very short and concise. And the premise of the book is looking at whether we actually have free will. So to most people, it feels like they are making choices, they're deciding what they should and shouldn't do, but is this really the case? And what Harris asserts is that this isn't actually true, and really decisions that we make are a result of our genetics, our parentings, where we were born, our brain chemistry, all of these things that we didn't pick, and so on. And There is a kind of overlap between Harris and Sapolsky, and I've seen Sapolsky also state in interviews that he believes free will is an illusion. And despite the book being only an hour long, it has had a really big impact on me, and it is something that I cannot stop thinking about. It's kind of taking me down this rabbit hole on the topic, and so much so I am going to do a whole separate podcast on the topic. And it's something I've been trying to put together for the last couple of months. And it's it's just partly written, but I I am going to get there. So if you want to have your mind slowly implode on itself uh, as you start to contemplate this stuff, then I do recommend checking out the book. And I'd highly recommend doing it on Audible and listening to that way. Harris then reads the book and it's a a very easy way to, to consume it. So the remaining three books are all on the theme of babies and parenting. And this year has been filled with pregnancy and childbirth and being a new dad. And so a lot of what I've read has been dealing with these topics. 
So the first of these books is Nobody Told Me by Holly McNish. And this was actually a book that was sent to Ali after Ramsey was born from a friend who'd had a kid maybe a year before, and she found it really comforting and wanted to, to pass it on. So this is actually a book that we read together. And more recently, we've got into a habit of me reading out loud in bed so that Ali gets to listen while she's feeding, getting Ramsey off to sleep. And it's a really enjoyable experience. It seems to work really well, and it works incredibly well for books of this nature. So the book is a part memoir, part poetry book. It's written by a Scottish poet who chronicles her life um, from finding out that she's pregnant, I think she's around 27 or 28, somewhere around there, um, to having the, bi- the baby, her little one, and all the way through until the little one is three years old. And she talks about the struggles of nausea and pregnancy, a baby that won't sleep and screams, the misadventures of breastfeeding public, about feeling like she's not doing enough, and just the general overwhelm of being a new parent. It's incredibly honest and incredibly open and while her situation and our situation aren't the exact same there's a lot of common humanity in what she writes about and so it made it a really great book for Ali and I to read together and to then be able to chat about certain parts of it and it's probably the first time I've read poetry since having to study it as part of English in school so poetry does not feature heavily in my life but I did really enjoy her poems and it made me appreciate poetry uh, more and want to find other poets or other poetry that I really like. So if there is anyone out there wanting to, to, to give a present to a new, a new mom or new dad, I would definitely recommend this book and I'm really glad that someone gave it to us. So the next book is called Why Love Matters by Sue Gerhardt. And this book explains why loving relationships are essential for brain development and nervous system development in the early years of life, and how this then has a knock-on effect into adulthood and the consequences on emotional and physical health. So as part of the book, it explains what love really looks like for a little human being and why this is important to them. And it also looks at what happens when this doesn't happen, which is largely experienced as stress and and what this does then to the brain and the body. And it's very well researched and scientifically focused, but doesn't feel too difficult to read. So there are lots of mentions about different hormones and brain regions, which everyone's not going to be familiar with. But it definitely feels like a book that is understandable for the layperson. And Ali and I have been reading it together and She has no trouble following along. So the final book I want to mention is called The Positive Birth Book by Millie Hill. And this was one of the first, it wasn't the first, but one of the early books that I read around uh, pregnancy and birth after we found out that Ali was pregnant. And I'm really glad that I did. So Millie Hill is a writer and mother of three children. Uh, In 2012, she set up a group called the Positive Birth Movement, which is an antenatal discussion group to give women access to better support and information. And it just kind of spread like wildfire. And there are now over 400 groups running all around the world. And we actually went to a number of the group meetings near us when Ali was pregnant, and I found it really helpful and a really great support. So the book is really about all the different aspects of childbirth. So looking at the impact of culture and why we think about childbirth the way that we do in the West, it goes through all the different stages of childbirth. So what with uh, like what what's going to happen at each stage, and it has different women interviewed as part of that, talking about their experiences at each of these different phases and what it felt like them felt like to them and how that happened. It talks about the different components of a birth plan and what to think about in advance. So where you want to give birth, what kind of monitoring you want in labor, optimal cord clamping, skin to skin, vitamin K, like lots of different things. And it really just touched on so much stuff that as a first time dad who was going to be part of the labor process, I had no idea about. And it was done in a very easy to to read way. 
and I'm actually been trying to get Millie Hill on the podcast for a while now. We've been emailing back and forth and we'll possibly record something in the January or February time, but scheduling for this one hasn't been easy. She's got three kids um, and so it's just been a bit of a challenge, but I really love the opportunity to talk to her because I really like the information that she's put out and what she's created in terms of the positive birth movement. So that is it for the book section. So again, there is the full list that you can go and see in the show notes. So now let's talk about documentaries. So my favorite documentary for 2017 was actually something I watched way back at the start of the year. And yet still nothing has surpassed it. And whenever the topic of combination turns to documentaries, it is the first thing that I mention. And it's called Tickled and is probably one of the weirdest documentaries I've ever seen. Uh, It's a New Zealand reporter uh, comes across a video online about a thing called competitive endurance tickling. And there's got videos of guys in like sports attire who are tickling each other while they're being tied up. But as a sport... And the videos were put up by a company called Jane O'Brien Media. So he sends them an email and says he'd love to do a story on the sport and he'd love to do an interview with them. But he gets this completely insane email back condemning him for being gay and saying that they don't want anything to do with him. And so he then decides to dig a little deeper and it just goes off the rails from here. And he starts getting death threats and they start finding people who were part of the tickling videos and received large amounts of money for for participating. But when they said that they didn't want to do it anymore, they start getting blackmailed and all these ramifications. And then there's a large focus of the film. It's like trying to find out who is behind the company, Joan O'Brien Media, and why these videos are being made because they are spending literally millions and millions making these videos. But what for? And it's just so bizarre that I find it hard to describe this documentary. There, there's no point of reference to say it's kind of like this or it's kind of like that. All I would say is just please watch it. I remember when I finished it, I just spent hours afterwards on Google wanting to find out more. It's just that kind of a weird story. Um, and this to me is what a great documentary is about. It, it takes a subject matter you have no interest in, and let's be honest, I think there's probably very few people who would say they have a keen interest in competitive endurance tickling, but despite not being interested in the topic, you find uh, this documentary just fascinating, and that was how I found it. Um, So please check it out and let me know what you think. For all the people I've recommended to, everyone has enjoyed it as much as I have, and no one has, has a bad word to say about it. So the next documentary is called Embrace. It follows the story of Taryn uh, Brumford, who was a photographer who struggled with her body after having kids. So she decided to do a bodybuilding contest and got into what would be considered great shape by society standards. But despite the change in her appearance, she still felt just as dissatisfied in her body. So instead, she started working on body image rather than her body. And then she put up a before and after picture on Facebook, but it was the reverse of what is the norm. So the before was her on stage in the bodybuilding contest, and then the after was uh, her afterwards, where she was carrying more weight. I think she was actually like nude, but with stuff covering her private parts as part of the video, uh, as part of the photo, sorry. And, and as part of that post, she talked about how much happier she was now. And this picture that she put up on Facebook with these before and afters, it just went viral. And in a very short space of time, it was shared by millions of people. And she was being asked to be interviewed on all kinds of chat shows and news shows. So off the back of this, she then did a Kickstarter campaign and she got the funds together to make a documentary about body image. And that's what the film is about. And I think she's done a really great job. It is something that I often recommend to clients who are struggling, but I actually think it would be a worthwhile watch for anyone. Um, So Embrace, definitely check it out. Um, It's definitely well worth a watch. So the next documentary, and we are back into the realm of the weird again. And if I hadn't seen Tickled, this would have been the strangest documentary I watched this year. Uh, And it's called Love and Sources, uh, but sources spelt like flying sources. 
and it tells the story of David Huggins, who is this unassuming 72-year-old guy who claims to have had lifetime encounters with aliens. So from as young as he can remember, he was being visited by aliens, but actually these memories only came back to him later in life. And since these memories have started coming back to him, he's been painting pictures depicting those encounters. And so the documentary is largely an interview with David telling his story with his paintings then being used to show different encounters. And so whether that's him being a little boy um, playing in the yard with the aliens in the background or him losing his virginity to an alien, to him being in a room with all his part alien children, uh, he has pictures and paintings for this stuff. So yes, it is very weird, but it is also a really sweet film. And it was actually directed by Brad Abrahams. Um, And I've actually had Brad on the podcast before. He was on with Jeremy Stewart. And the two of them are working on and and have been working on for quite some time a documentary called On the Back of a Tiger. And that looks at some of the flaws of the scientific and medical establishment. And it's something that I'm really looking forward to seeing when it finally sees the light of day. Uh, Love and Sources is obviously a very different topic. Uh, But it was shot beautifully, it was edited really nicely with the paintings done by David helping to illuminate the story. So if you like a strange documentary, I would definitely recommend giving it a watch. The next documentary is called Polyfaces, and it tells the story of the farm run by Joel Salatin. So I first heard about Joel Salatin probably six or seven years ago, whenever I read Michael Pollan's book, The Omnivore's Dilemma. So Salatin is an organic farmer who breeds cattle and chicken and like lots of different animals and lots of different food. And I know the term organic has become bastardized and watered down and people argue whether it's true, if it is really better for people's health or it's just some expensive marketing that middle-class people really lap up. Well, what Salison does is what true organic farming is meant to be about. So rather than just doing the minimum to be allowed to put a sticker on a product so that you can charge a premium, he is someone who is completely and absolutely passionate about the sustainability of the planet and the lives of the animals who live on his farm. And he wants there to be a revolution so that farming is all done in this way. So The documentary is looking at all of the goings-on on on Polyface, his farm, and how the different animals live in this symbiotic relationship with one another and with nature, and just how the animals are actually supporting the natural environment. So it's not making it worse, it's making it better, and how Joel is trying to teach this to other people with all the interns and all the other people who come and work on the farm. And he isn't anti-technology um, and doesn't talk about how things used to be better in the good old days. Like He talks about how new technologies have been so helpful for him and his farm, but it's about using this stuff to mimic and support nature, not doing things that are unnatural, that are for short-term profit, but actually are damaging over the long term. And I've been fascinated with Joel Salatin since first reading about him. So this is a really great behind the curtain look at the farm that he runs and just getting more of a sense of who he is. So the next documentary is called Betting on Zero uh, and it's all about Herbalife. So Herbalife is a company that sells a multitude of different supplements and weight loss shakes Uh, But despite being a billion dollar company, it's been accused of being a pyramid scheme. So anyone can become a Herbalife distributor, but as part of this, as the distributor, you buy the goods in advance and then you have to sell them on. But what happens is that distributors end up buying huge amounts of stock to get bigger discounts because the more you buy, the, the cheaper it is to buy it. And then they can't shift this stuff. So they have huge amounts sitting in their house, in their garage, whatever, but they can't get rid of it. So Herbalife is making a fortune, but it's really the distributors that are buying it and going into huge debt, and they're not able to sell it on. So a hedge fund investor called Bill Ackman decided to take a short position on Herbalife stock. 
So for anyone who's seen the film or read the book, The Big Short, it's the same thing. You take a position that you believe the company is going to go down in value. And if it does go down in value, you make money. So Ackman took out a short on Herbalife and then started this campaign to get the company investigated for being a pyramid scheme and trying to bring the company down. Um, because he says he has this real belief that he doesn't like the way that the company acts and how it treats people. And so he's doing this from a position or a place of, of being good natured. But then another investor called Carl Icon, who is a multi-billionaire who had previously had a falling out with Ackman decides that he's going to use this to try and destroy him financially. And so he takes the opposite position and starts trying to support Herbalife and increase their share value. And so it's then just this really interesting battle between these two guys and their different positions. And the film is fairly depressing in parts. And people who have had very little being told that they could make an absolute fortune in Herbalife, spending what little life savings they had, and then just ending up broke with garages full of supplements that they can't shift. And you then have these two men who are worth absolute fortunes battling it out. And as honourable as Ackman's intention may be with wanting to see people spared from this and for Herbalife to go under or to change his practices, there's also the fact that he's going to profit massively if this happens. And it leaves you just wondering how much of this is doing good and how much of this is still about making money. And so it was a really interesting film. And if you don't want to watch a whole documentary on the topic, uh, John Oliver uh, did a really great piece about Herbalife and MLMs or in general um, for his show last week tonight. So if you Google John Oliver uh, multi-level marketing, I think if you just Google John Oliver um, Herbalife, it will come up and there's a, there's a half an hour video that he's done on it, which is uh, very much worth a watch and very funny, but also gets to the heart of why these kinds of companies are a problem. So the penultimate documentary I want to mention uh, is Amy, and it's about the life and death of Amy Winehouse. Prior to this documentary, I didn't know a huge amount about her. I obviously knew some of her hit songs, but kind of not really. I'd lived in the UK while she was on the cover of magazines and newspapers as her life was unraveling and I, I knew about her death, but I didn't really know much about her. And so I found this documentary incredibly interesting, but also incredibly sad. She was someone who had so much talent. Uh, not only did she have an amazing voice, she was also a brilliant songwriter. And I didn't know much of her music, but it was unsurprisingly uh, heavily appearing in the documentary. And as the songs were played, the lyrics were then on the screen. And it was so deeply personal. So she was someone who was writing all her own music. She wasn't a pop star who was being having songs written for them. She was writing herself. And so all of the lyrics and everything she talked about was very deeply personal about her life. She's someone who struggled with mental health issues. She struggled with uh, bulimia since being a teenager. Uh, she seemed to not get over her parents divorcing when she was younger. And you just see the complete circus that her life became where she'd walk out of her front door and just be accosted with photographers. And I kind of imagine myself being in my early 20s, having all of this money and all of this fame, but also all of this pressure and just what it would be like. And she then got into heavy drugs. So she was smoking crack. She was doing heroin and just this mix with heavy drinking, mixing with bulimia. It just all spiraled. And I think it is easy to imagine how amazing it would be to be famous, to be a movie star, to be a musician, to have all that money, but it's not. And documentaries like this really highlight this. And Ali, my other half, actually works in the music industry. So I am privy to how much of things aren't as they seem and how much money and fame does not equal happiness. So while this film left me feeling incredibly upset at such a waste of life and such a waste of talent, it was also a reminder of how easy it is to imagine how much better famous people have it and how this is typically very misguided. So the final documentary, documentary I want to mention 
isn't very new. It was from 2005. I just not got around to watching it. And it's called Grizzly Man, and it's by uh, Werner Herzog. And Herzog was actually on my list of documentaries for last year for uh, Into the Inferno. He's a real prolific documentarian, and I'm yet to see one of his films that I haven't enjoyed. So Grizzly Man chronicles the life and death of bear enthusiast Timothy Treadwell. So Treadwell spent 13 summers hanging out in national parks in Alaska, living amongst the brown bears. And when I say living amongst brown bears, like within touching distance of the brown bears. And for the last five years he was there, he films the bears and his interactions with them. Uh, he also films like vlog style videos where he's talking to cramp to, to the camera. And this all amounted to about 100 hours of film. And then in October 2003, Treadwell and his girlfriend were killed and eaten by a grizzly bear. And so the documentary is extracts from the footage that Treadmill had shot, as well as interviews with friends and family and park rangers and so on, to help tell Treadwell's story. And if you've ever seen a Herzog documentary, you know his voice. He always narrates them, and he has this beautiful German-accented English that is slow and precise in its use of language. And he does just such a wonderful job with this, telling the story or finding pieces of film that tell the story in their own way without him having to say anything. And it is a story about someone who is very concerned with nature and the bears, but also someone who wants to just escape from the real world and is unable to cope with parts of his past or about who he is. And what I would say is let this film be the one that gets you into Herzog as a documentarian and then work your way back through his catalogue because you won't be disappointed. I think he's an incredible filmmaker and just telling these nice, beautiful stories. So that's it on the documentary fund. And so let's now deal with the podcast. So this is actually the first year that I've talked about podcasts, but considering how much time they take up now in my life and how much joy they bring to me, um, it feels like appropriate to, to mention them. So the first podcast to mention is called Revisionist History, and it's by Malcolm Gladwell. So Gladwell is the author of numerous best-selling books. So The Tipping Point, Blink, Outliers and David and Goliath. And I've read all of them and I love his ability to, to tell and write a story, but he's not only good at writing a story, he has this amazing voice and this amazing ability to actually tell a spoken word story. And Revisionist History currently has two seasons, both have 10 episodes in them. And so when a new season starts for the next 10 Thursdays, I get up, I wake up, I'm excited, and then once it's over, I just have to wait. And so probably the same way that people think of Games of Thrones or some other new TV show, I think of for revisionist history. I really do love it that much. And now with each of the podcasts I'm going to recommend, I'm going to pick an episode that I've listened to this year. So that's going to be the second season for revisionist history. And I really enjoyed episode five. It's called The Prime Minister and His Proof. And this episode tells the story of Winston Churchill's close friend and confidant, who is this eccentric scientist named uh, Frederick Lindemann, whose connection to Churchill altered the course of British policy during World War II, and not in a good way. So it tells of the devastation that this had on India and millions of people who died of starvation at the hands of Churchill. And really for me, there isn't a poor episode in the whole of revisionist history. From season one, um, there's an episode called Hallelujah, which looks at how genius emerges. And it uses Leonard Cohen's song, Hallelujah, and the journey and the iterations that he went on to become the memorable song that we think of today. So that's probably another one to check out, but really just start anywhere, start from the beginning, start with any of these episodes. I really do think you're going to enjoy Revisionist History. It's a, it's a really solid podcast. So the next podcast is Waking Up by Sam Harris. So I already mentioned Harris in my favorite books, and I really have become a fanboy of his over the last 
12 to 18 months since I discovered him. I'd known him for a while, but I, I don't know what clicked. Some, somehow I got into his podcast and it just kind of took off like that. And his podcast is up to episode 110 at my time of recording this. And I've listened to every single one of them. And I went back and binged on every episode. And I think I had a couple of weeks where I listened to nothing but his podcasts. And now, as soon as a new episode comes out, I will listen to it on that day. And Harris is a neuroscientist, but he went back to study neuroscience after 10 years getting deeply into meditation and trying a wide range of psychedelics. He's probably the most well-spoken person I can think of with a vocabulary that is just enviable. Um, he's someone who the term deep thinker is hugely applicable and spends his time focusing on politics, morality, religion, which he's pretty vehemently against, uh, human nature, AI, uh, science, political correctness. Um, and what I really like about Harris is that he's someone who is clearly on the left, but he also talks about all the problems that he sees with the left at the moment. And there's this thing about beliefs that typically if someone holds a belief, a whole load of others come along for the ride. So if you were to tell me you're a Republican or if you're a Democrat, I could probably guess your stance on things like gun control or abortion or a whole host of other beliefs because people just clump those kind of beliefs together as, as part of that label of I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican. But with Harris, this isn't the case, and he's happy to be more nuanced with his beliefs. So he talks about being pro-guns, but what this really means to him, and just has beliefs and ideas that would not be normally considered leftist, despite being left of centre. And he's also someone who's happy to have tough conversations. So rather than just inviting a guest on, asking them softball questions and agreeing on everything, he often has people on who he disagrees with and he sees if he can have an intelligent conversation and I just don't really know anyone else who is doing this. So the episode that I suggest starting with is episode 56 called Abusing Dolores and it's an interview that he did with Paul Bloom and Bloom has actually been on the show a number of times but this for me is the best one that he's done although they are all really good to listen to. And he talks as part of this episode about why he is against empathy and why he thinks there's problems with empathy and instead why people really should be striving for compassion. And they talk about morality and the irrationality of human beings. Uh, they cover AI and the show Westworld, which is where the title comes from, as Dolores is one of the characters in the show. And the episode is over, like, two hours long but it is definitely time well spent and once you're done like make your way through the other episodes he also does a really great interview with uh william mccaskill from effective altruism uh it's episode 44 called being good and doing good uh looking at how people can effectively donate and where the best way for this uh, the, the best way to, to do donations and and how to live a, an altruistic life it's highly fascinating uh, but for me i really like all of these episodes so so check them out the next podcast show to recommend is the adam buxton podcast so buxton is a british comedian a writer and an actor and as part of the podcast, he interviews musicians and actors and authors and comedians, etc. And I know that there are a lot of people doing this kind of thing these days. So Mark Maron or Tim Ferriss or James Altucher, James Altucher. Um, but I really like Buxton's style. He's very funny and quick-witted and very British. Uh, all his interviews are done in person. So rather than being via Skype or phone, he meets the person in real life and he does the show that way. And it just seems to create a more relaxed feel. And so the episode that I recommend checking out is one of the more recent ones. It was an interview he did with uh, Hassan Akkad um, or Akkad. Uh, it's episode 57. So Hassan is a Syrian refugee who left Damascus and came to the UK and the show is really his story and what was going on in Syria and how he came to, to end up in Europe. 
And truthfully, I know very little about world affairs. Like, yes, I can know about issues going on in Syria, but in reality, I don't know much about it at all. So I was engrossed to, to hear his story and everything that he went through to make it to this country. And it left me feeling incredibly lucky, but also guilty for how easy my life has been in comparison. Um, but it is a really interesting episode and it makes, hopefully, you change ideas and preconceptions about refugees. And I'm pretty pro all of that stuff, but it was still very eye-opening for me. And as an aside, I have a number of friends who have set up a campaign to support refugees. There is a store in London called Choose Love where everything you buy, you leave behind and it just goes to supporting refugees. And this is everything from socks and gloves and blankets to psychological support and medical kits. And there's also a website which is http uh, uh, choose la, choose love. Um, where you can do the same online. And it's an incredible initiative that I want to support. So I want to recommend that you check it out and see what you think. So the next podcast I want to mention is called Conversations uh, with Richard Feidler. And it's done by the ABC in Australia and was actually a recommendation from my dad. So yes, my old man is giving me podcast suggestions. So Conversations is similar to Adam Buxton in terms of there is a host and they are interviewing guests, uh, but rather than it being celebrities or musicians, it's more authors or journalists or just people who have an incredible story to tell, people that you have never heard of before, just normal everyday folks. And over the years, as I've had my own podcast, I've discovered how much there is an art to being an interviewer. And I get just as much joy out of the Conversations podcast from Feidler as his skill as an interviewer um, as from anything else. He's someone who is incredibly interested in his guests, and you can tell that he has done a load of prep himself. It's not like someone has just handed him the questions. Um, you can tell that he's an intelligent guy and knows a lot about the world as well. He's also a fantastic listener, and he just... It doesn't just feel like everything is scripted in advance. It genuinely is a conversation. But I also get the fact that most, or I sorry, I like the fact uh, that most of the people on the show I've never heard of before. And once you start listening to enough podcasts, you start to see that the same guests start popping up again and again on different shows. And people are just on the, the podcast circuit and it becomes a bit samey. But with Feidler, this doesn't seem to happen. And it's hard to pick a particular episode to recommend because none of them are real standouts as, as, as in, like, you must listen to this episode. It's amazing. But yet, I never regret listening to the show. I always just find them enjoyable and a great listen. But if I had to pick one, I would really suggest an episode uh, called Utopia Now, A Radical Rethinking of Wealth, uh, Work, Wealth, and Freedom. And so it's an interview he did with a historian and author called uh, Rutger Bregman about the concept of uh, universal basic income. And so this is an idea that has started to become more popular and talked about, uh, especially in tech circles, and that it's come up from tech circles because th there's this idea that in the not-too-distant future, robots are going to replace so many of the jobs that we do today and that new ones aren't going to return to replace them. And that at some point we are going to have mass unemployment and a solution that is often suggested to ease this is universal basic income. This concept, though, of universal basic income, as I discovered as part of this podcast, is actually not something new and it's been around for a long time. And this is what Bregman then talks about. And he goes through some of the different pilot studies that looked at this back in the 1970s and talks about different presidents and prime ministers who were in favour of this back then, but it then just got pushed aside. But it looks at these pilot studies and the schemes that were done. And despite people's idea of something like universal basic income being a handout and being incredibly costly, it actually saved the government money in reduced costs in other areas. So reduced law enforcement, reduced medical costs. 
And so I found it really fascinating. It's a topic I've wanted to dig into more for a long time. And while I know this podcast just scratches the surface on this issue, I really enjoyed listening to what he had to say. So the penultimate episode I want to mention or podcast that I want to mention uh, is called Where Should We Begin with Esther Perel? And this was something I only recently discovered. So some friends came down to ours recently for the weekend or for lunch and we were just chatting about different podcasts and we were both trading our favorites. And this was one that my uh, friend Nick was listening to at the time and really enjoyed. So Esther Perel is a psychotherapist that works around the topics of relationships and intimacy and sex. And she wrote a book in 2006 called Mating Captivity about the competing human desires for safety versus adventure and how monogamy impacts on this. And more recently, she's written a book called The State of Affair, uh, Rethinking Infidelity. And this podcast is then linked into this most recent book. It's it's a form of advertising for this most recent book, but it's not like you're sitting through a commercial. Uh, It is recordings of 10 sessions that she's done with 10 different couples as they work through an affair that has been committed and what happened and what, how they're feeling and all of that. And it is just completely fascinating. Like for me as a practitioner, it was helpful to hear her methods and how she asked questions and guided the conversation. But then there is me as someone who is in a monogamous relationship. And so it was enlightening to hear these people's stories and for me to be able to hear similarities and differences and yeah, just start to think about my own experience. And Perel has a real gift, and it is evident from listening to her that she's very skilled as a therapist. And it also makes you rethink whatever preconceptions you have about infidelity, and that it's not so straightforward. Well, at least not in the cases on the podcast. And I'm not saying that it's fine that people should be committing affairs, nothing of that nature. I'm just saying when you listen to this, you see that it's a little different to what the preconception often is around this term. And in terms of where to start, I genuinely could not answer. I listened to the whole series of 10 episodes, I think in two or three days. So they all blur into one. And I also think it's something that should be listened to in its entirety, kind of like going through a novel. So if you ever wanted to be a fly on a wall in a couple's therapy session, uh, give this a listen. So the final podcast I want to mention is called uh, You Are Not So Smart. And it's a podcast I mentioned before at some point. I know I was interviewed for Merit Boxler's podcast and I mentioned it there. I can't remember if I mentioned it on this podcast before. So the You Are Not So Smart podcast is all about human biases, fallacies, and delusions. And so each episode looks at a different bias or fallacy and interviews a scientist or researcher or expert in this particular topic. So things like survivorship bias or narrative bias or optimism bias or the backfire effect or the Dunning-Kruger effect and just goes through what these things are, what the research shows on it, And I find it just so fascinating. I think the more we can become aware of these bugs in our thinking, the more we can try and be on guard to them. It also covers other areas of psychology, so things like learned helplessness or misremembering or motivation or other areas. And so this is a podcast that you can easily pick episodes based on the title. So just start with the biases or the fallacies that interest you and go from there. Um, one of the recent episodes that I really enjoyed was called Sleep, Lef- Sleep Deprivation and Bias. And it looked at how when you're getting less sleep, you start to adjust your expectations. So while you think it's not affecting you so much, they can then do cognitive tests that show that it really is. So in a sense, you become impaired about being able to see how much your lack of sleep is causing damage to your functioning. But the sleep deprivation doesn't just affect cognitive ability, it also affects other biases. So there's a test called the implicit bias test, um, and it's a way to test what are our natural biases. And I've actually talked about this test before in episode 21 of the podcast called How Beliefs Are Formed. 
but it's a way to see people's biases, biases in terms of race or sex or sexuality. And what they talk about in this episode is how sleep deprivation makes people more implicitly biased. And when they restore proper sleep, these biases largely start to disappear. And so really interesting. And I know for me, this episode came up um, and I naturally graduated towards it because it came out in early September and Ramsey was due around the same time. So I knew I was shortly going to be getting a lot less sleep and I wanted to know what, what this really had in, in store for me. Um, but as I said, I like all the episodes of this show, so really just start with the things that jump out at you in terms of the title and, and make your way through. So that brings to a close today and today's episode, and it really has been a truly memorable year, and these are some of the books or documentaries or podcasts that have featured for it uh, in it for me. And if you have any thoughts on any of the things on this list, I'd love to hear from you. Or if you have your own recommendations, I would love to hear from you too. And you can either go to the show notes at www.7-health.com forward slash 109 and leave a comment, or you can email me at info at 7health.com. And I'll be back again in a couple of weeks. But until then, look after yourself and enjoy the start of 2018. Thanks for listening.